Okay, hi everyone. It's 1030 and we will go ahead and get started with Florida friendly landscaping for pollinators. Um, I hope everybody's having a calm and peaceful holiday season so far, and I hope it continues that way. Um, we are, let me get my, my screen up here. We are gonna be recording this presentation and we will be um, putting it on our, our YouTube channel um, in the near future. So um, it will be available after today. Let me get this up. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can share, can see my screen. If not, please um, put it in the chat that you can't see it and I will adjust. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Susan Griffith and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here at UF IFAS Manatee County Extension. And I don't mean to bring everyone down <laughs> talking about um, such a serious subject as this, but um, pollinators, as we all probably do realize by now, are in trouble. Um, and this was something that came across my radar very recently. Um, every Thanksgiving, the Xerces Society does its annual Western Monarch count at the overwintering sites of the Monarch along the California coast. And in the past, um, like in the 1990s, there were millions of Monarchs that were counted every year reliably. They could count on finding millions of Monarchs. Um, in 2016, it had dropped down to about 298,000. And in 2017, it dropped again to about 192,000. And then again, uh, scientists were very alarmed in 2018 and 2019 when the count dropped really significantly again and fewer than 30,000 were found. Um, but this year, researchers were really astonished when fewer than 2,000 could be counted. So uh, talk about, uh, you know, an alarming drop. Um, now, this, of course, is a snapshot of the situation. This is only this small area, well, relatively small area of the west coast of California. But it, it, this snapshot does tell us a, a good deal. Um, about what's happening. So Florida friendly landscaping practices um, employed in your yard can actually help the pollinator, pollinators plight. We can help mitigate the loss of biodiversity that is occurring at an accelerated rate. Butterflies as well as other invertebrates are losing populations at a really alarming level across the world. And this is due to pesticide usage. This is due to increased wildfires, which may have a lot to do with the situation right now in California, particularly um, because they had such an aggressive wildfire season, which certainly did have an impact on, on delicate creatures such as pollinators, um, as well as other factors, of course. Um, so we, we can definitely make a difference in our yards and especially in our communities by changing some of our practices and really adopting a new approach of recognizing our landscapes as being part of the ecosystem rather than being separate from it. A Florida Friendly Yard incorporates the following nine principles, right plant, right place, watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, mulch, mulching, attracting wildlife, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, an aspect of attracting wildlife. Um, and also we'll be touching on managing yard pests responsibly because those things are very intertwined. Attracting pollinators and managing our yard pests responsibly really go hand in hand. Um, number seven is recycling. Number eight is reducing stormwater runoff. 
and number nine is protecting the waterfront. So if you want to support butterflies and have them live in your yard, like who doesn't want that? <laughs> the best thing that you can do right now is to start planting native larval host plants. These are the plants that butterflies look for. They sense them out and they lay their eggs on them because that is the food that, that the larva that hatches out of their eggs is going to need. Uh, to in order to survive. So they lay their eggs on these plants, these larval host plants, and then the larva starts to eat the plant. So remember that you are planting these plants purposely for the caterpillars to eat them. That is the whole point of it. <laughs> so here is what a lawn looks like to native pollinators. Not really. I'm, I'm kind of joking with this, but it really, there's nothing there to interest them in a, a yard that's just dominated by, by lawn, by turf grass, and non-native palms. Here's an example of someone who had a turf grass dominated um, traditional front yard. Um, they killed their grass and they did this, which is a much more pollinator friendly FFL remodeling of that yard. So creating habitat means putting the right plant in the right place. If you have a nice pollinator garden like this, you have these great colors and textures and very low watering requirements once it's established. And it's just a haven for pollinators. Habitat also requires a balance of cover and open spaces. So people sometimes don't realize that we do have a lot of, of bees particularly that, that do, um, have colonies in the ground, so they need those open spaces as well. Always keep in mind if you do live in an HOA situation that you will need to get approval before making any changes to your landscape. It is against the law to prevent them from using Florida-friendly landscaping principles in, in your yard. However, they still have a say in how you can do that. Um, you can, you still have to submit your plans to your architectural review board or committee, and they still have the right to make changes to your plans as they see fit. There are really four major requirements for pollinator friendly gardens. Um, number one is providing that food that they need. So um, that is in the form of not only the larval host plants that I mentioned, but also the food for the adults, which are the nectar and the pollen plants. For cover, um, it's a really great idea to put in what we call vertical layering in the landscape. So essentially you're using three different heights of plants, ground covers, shrubs, and trees in, in combination with one another. So you get that vertical layering. Um, as far as habitat goes, pollinators like to have some sun and some shade. And like I mentioned, your, your native ground bees also need some elements of loose and sandy soil and more open areas. And of course, water, every living thing on earth needs to have water. So pollinators really require um, shallow, fresh, clean water with stones to perch on. And butterflies um, like to puddle. They like to drink, they call it puddling, <laughs> drinking from barely wet sand. So that's another thing that you, you can provide. So food in the form of nectar plants. Um, when we're talking about nectar plants, we're really talking about plants with the tubular flowers. And those are gonna be your main nectar providers. And nectar is the sugary substance that gives pollinators energy. Um, they also attract hummingbirds. Um, which are also uh, a minor pollinator. So things like the native coral honeysuckle vine, which is a, a really well-behaved vine. Um, if you've ever had a bad experience with the vines in the past, you may have had a vine that was not native and it may have 
tried to take over your entire backyard. <laughs> I know I am one of those unlucky individuals who has been through this, um, but I can tell you that the native coral honeysuckle vine is a really well-behaved vine. It, it just kind of stays put on its trellis and does its job. It will attract lots and lots of butterflies to nectar from it and bees as well. As far as shrubs go, there's a nice native coral bean shrub that also blooms with those very attractive red tubular flowers. And our native tropical sage is another great one for providing nectar. Here is the backyard of one of our master gardeners. Um, it's really an outstanding pollinator garden that she has in her backyard. And that's a, a huge expanse of tropical sage shown there in the foreground. Norma, if you're out there, hello. Food in the form of pollen plants. Um, I like to say that food is easy because food for them is all of the pretty flowers that we want to have in our gardens anyway. So it's not like we are bending over backwards to do something we, we don't want anyway. Adding flowers is always a good thing. So um, pollen can come in the form of these Coreopsis that are pictured to the right. And there's some black eyed Susan in there as well, it looks like. Um, and also below the native purple coneflower, all of these are native wildflowers and pollen provides protein for pollinators. And here is a lovely sea of our native Gylardia. cover. Um, you want to keep it natural as possible, provide that vertical layering that we talked about. Um, the three levels of plants make pollinators feel safe, like they are in a natural space. And it's also very attractive. So habitat for the native ground bees, they need those open sandy patches. Digger bees are solitary ground bees, um, and some bumblebees actually um, nest in, in ground colonies. They're all underground. You can definitely spot them by their very distinctive appearance shown below. Just try to be careful and give them wide berth. If you know that they're there, try not to step on a bee. If it is female, um, it may sting you out of just as a last resort, bees never want to sting you because they die when they sting you. Um, only female bees have stingers and digger bees actually don't have stingers at all. Some other aspects of habitat are really important. Um, leaving your leaf litter. The red banded hair streak uh, butterfly lays their eggs on fallen oak leaves, for example. So the fallen oak leaves become the first food, the larval food source for the, their caterpillars when they emerge. Um, and plus, it's also a really good habitat for, um, for helping other invertebrates, um, such as worms. And there's just a multitude of, of other invertebrates that um, that live in, in situations like that in your yard. And actually, it's really, really helpful for the birds too to, to leave something like this. You can also move areas like this, leaf piles like this, if, if your HOA is giving you a hard time about it, just relocate it somewhere where they can't see it. Um, they're really, really a good thing to have on your property. Water and minerals, very, very important. And you can make these quite attractive puddlers for pollinators out of an old bird bath. So you can fill either just a shallow dish like a terracotta plant a saucer that's shown here, um, just a few stones in it, and you can add some sand um, and just make sure that the water stays clean and never ever use bleach or any other harsh chemicals to clean the container. Really, you can just, if you need to clean it for algae or something like that, just um, a plain scrubby pad usually does the job and just rinse it out with, with plain water after scrubbing it with the scrubby. 
there is nothing quite as beautiful and magical as a garden full of butterflies. Um, so they may not be quite as efficient a pollinator as a bee, but they can still pollinate plants. And if you'd like to be visited by more butterflies, uh, try planting some of these larval host plants. Without these plants, butterflies have nothing to eat. The butterfly larva, that is, have nothing to eat. So um, it's very important to supply these as part of the, the butterfly life cycle. Our native Gulf fritillary butterfly has to have the native passion vines as their larval <coughs> food source. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, they will definitely eat them. As you can see in this picture, the Gulf fritillary larvae are just going to town <coughs> on that Passiflora incarnata, um, which has that really, really pretty purple flower that's so frilly and gorgeous. And the other native passion vine, the Suberosa, Passiflora Suberosa, has um, a definitely less ostentatious flower. It's, it's more subdued, <laughs> much smaller, um, but still equally an important plant in the life cycle of, of the Gulf fritillary and also the zebra longwing and the corky stem passion flower with the little flower. This often comes up as a native volunteer in, in people's yards and, and some people don't know what it is. They think um, that it might be poison ivy or, or something like that because the leaf is a little similar. Um, but nope, this is a, a welcome addition to your yard and it, it's another vine that is very well behaved. You, you may not even notice that it's there. Um, it's certainly something that you should leave because it is definitely a very important larval host plant. And our state butterfly, the zebra longwing, also uses these native passifloras. And this butterfly likes to live in shady environments. So keep that in mind that um, if you're going to go out and purchase some of these plants, plant some of them in the sun and some of them in the shade. And you'll get a, a nice mix of, of both of these butterflies. The Eastern Tiger Swallowtail uses, among other plants and trees, the Sweet Bay Magnolia. So adding a Sweet Bay Magnolia to your yard um, can definitely help increase your chances of being visited by the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail to lay her eggs. The Giant Swallowtail uses the Wild Lime tree. So again, um, planting a Wild Lime greatly increases your chance of having the wild, or the, sorry, the giant swallowtail. Um, and its larva it looks very much like bird poop and that's on purpose so that birds, birds would be reluctant to eat it. Birds may be wise to that by now, but it's a pretty good evolutionary strategy. The black swallowtail uses culinary herbs that we humans like to use um, in the Apiaceae family, which is the carrot family. So things like sweet fennel and parsley and dill, things that we might want to have around anyway to cook with. So you may, next time you shop for herbs, you may want to pick up a couple of extra of these um, to plant for your pollinators. And if you've ever come home from work one day and, and seen, uh, discovered that your, your parsley plant is completely ravaged <laughs> and you wonder, oh my gosh, what happened? Did my neighbor come in and take my parsley? Nope, you were probably visited by uh, a few
Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure what happened, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to get this back up again. <laughs> I am so sorry. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, let me see if I can get it to move. Okay, it's not moving. Um, I'm going to try one more time. This way. Okay, I think we got it. Okay, I hope you all can hear me and I hope you all can see. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have no idea what happened, but that's what happens in Zoom world sometimes. I'm sure you all know what I mean. Okay, so sulfur butterflies. These are the various yellow butterflies. Sometimes they're white um, or anywhere in between. Um, they are dependent upon the native senna and cassia plants. Um, they can also use um, the non-native ones, but really a lot of those tend to be either on the invasive side or cautionary as far as not being the greatest plant to add to your plant collection. So definitely I would recommend if you're going to get some native uh, or some senas or cassias, um, sometimes the names are used interchangeably, I would definitely go for the native. So um, visit your local native plant nursery for all of these plants that we've been talking about so far. The, um, the privet senna, the senna ligastrina is, is beautiful as is the Bahama senna. Um, Senna Mexicana Vera Chapmanii. And also um, this cute little tiny dainty sulfur butterfly, it actually uses what is sometimes considered a weed, um, but is an excellent native pollinator plant is Spanish needle, also known as Biden's alba. That is its larval host plant. So um, try to let a few of those live. I know letting a few of them live means having a hundred of them next season, <laughs> but weeding is good exercise, right? All right, the common buckeye uses native ground cover plants. And if you're, if you're looking for a, a great native ground cover, the twin flower is, is a wonderful ground cover. Discaristi oblongifolia is shown here, and this one is the one that tolerates a drier environment. There's also a Discaristi humestrata that needs a, a more damp environment. And here's the turkey tangle fog fruit again, which is another uh, a larval host for this butterfly as well. Um, a butterfly that they thought was going to go extinct a, a few years back, um, the, the Atala. This one uses the Kunti, the native Kunti, um, Azamia floridana, uh, as shown on, on the right side of the screen. Um, this one really is very, um, it's, it's making a comeback. Um, it, it would, Surprised me to see one in this area, really Brevard County, which is kind of across the state, about on our same level, um, is probably the closest to us um, and possibly a little bit more inland. Um, this butterfly um, makes it these days. But who knows, maybe it'll, um, as temperatures warm up, we, we may end up, and people are planting more Kunti, we may end up eventually having the Atala in our area. Here's what it looks like on the Kunti with its chrysalises and there is its caterpillar. Skippers use mostly native grasses, sedges and palms. So when we think about our, our native larval host plants, sometimes we really don't think of grasses as being in that category um, or palms for that matter. So um, like the Delaware skipper uses the blue stem 
native grass, the palmetto skipper gets its name palmetto skipper because it uses various palmettos. So silver saw palmetto is, is one of those uh, and the other palmettos as well. And berry skipper uses the white top sedge, which is a, a native sedge. So what are the differences people often ask between butterfly skippers and moths? Um, they do have a lot of similarities, but here are some, some few key differences. The butterflies have clubbed antennae. The skippers have curved and moths have very variable antennae that can be quite fine. Um, they can be plumose uh, or they can be feathery. So this little guy here, he's very teddy bear-like <laughs> and he has that, that really plumose um, antennae. And native milkweeds, of course, are the best larval food source for the monarch butterfly. And we do highly recommend using the native milkweeds rather than the more commonly found non-native tropical milkweed that you see everywhere. Um, I would definitely recommend that you go to your local native plant nursery and get yourself some native instead. Um, and there is a, a reason for that. Oh, and just a, a little bit of info in case you did not know, the, the male monarch, that's how you tell the difference between the female and the male very easily, visually, is the male has these black spots right down here and the female does not have those black spots. So a lot of people always wonder, well, what is the deal with the tropical milkweed? And why, why is it controversial? Well, part of the problem is that it remains green much longer than the natural um, cycle of, of the native milkweeds. So it remains green through the first frost in the south, and this enables monarchs to continue breeding into fall and winter. Um, this causes populations to persist, sometimes to become too large in some cases, and, um, and also the, the prolonged breeding can foster higher than normal rates of um, a lethal protozoan parasite that happens to attack monarchs um, called OE. Um, it can also increase the risk of exposure to the butterfly in, in different stages of its life, either as an adult or as a chrysalis or as larva, um, to freezing temperatures. Um, and another danger is that uh, probably not all of them, but probably a good percentage of these plants are grown in, in traditional non-native nurseries, which try to be a little bit more careful with their pesticide use. Um, traditional nurseries uh, may very well use systemic pesticides on the plants. Um, those are the pesticides that stay within the tissues of the plant. Um, that affect every part of the plant. So butterflies that feed from it could very well take in that pesticide and it would be toxic to the, to the butterfly larvae that feed upon it. Florida does have more than 20 native milkweeds. And this is really a, a snapshot of the best ones for monarchs, really. Um, this is what the researchers have found to be the best. The swamp milkweed, Asclepius uh, incarnata, the pine woods, Asclepius humistrata, aquatic milkweed, um, you can tell by the name of those two, the swamp and the aquatic, that these are probably going to need wetter soils. <laughs> so if you if you have an irrigated yard, they're probably going to be just fine with that. And the red ring milkweed, milkweed Asclepius variegata. Here is the the monarch life cycle. A lot of people are are fascinated by the monarchs because they're there's just something about them um, that makes them a little bit more mysterious and beloved. <laughs> um, here's their little egg, which is quite tiny, about the size of a nail head. And that's its first instar as it emerges from the egg. And then as it eats all of these milkweed plants, it has several different instars uh, as it grows larger and larger. And then it starts to form its chrysalis 
and the chrysalis ends up looking very much like a beautiful jade pendant um, that you could hang on a necklace uh, with looks like 18 karat gold trim on it. They're really quite beautiful. And as it matures, it becomes um, less opaque and you can start to see the butterfly wings. And then as it's ready to emerge, you can see it emerging there. And not all butterfly chrysalises look like that. A lot of them look like dead leaves and, and bark really. So the Gulf fritillary particularly likes to hang its chrysalises at the eaves of your roof line or on tree branches. Um, I have an arbor in, in my yard and it loves to, to attach its chrysalises to the arbor. Um, so learn to recognize these guys because otherwise they really do look like something that you might normally pick off and, and throw away as a dead leaf. Um, let me see. Oops, I was trying to look at questions and for some reason I can't see the questions. Um, let me revisit that in, in a minute. Um, but it's amazing how in this case, the giant swallowtail has completely um, camouflaged itself in, in an almost identical color. And, and it, it really is hard to distinguish that chrysalis from the little tree branch that it's attached to. Oops. Oh. I seem to be having, oh, there we go. Okay, good. I was gonna say we're having more technical difficulties, but I think we're okay. All right, um, there are a lot of monarch looking butterflies out there. Um, and the Viceroy is probably the most similar looking butterfly. Um, but the, how you distinguish it from a monarch is that it has this line here. See that, that line? The monarch does not have that. And can you tell me if this is a male or a female monarch? Look at those dots. And that would be a male. All right, how long do butterflies live? Well, unfortunately, butterflies like most insects lead a very ephemeral existence. And the answer to that really does depend on several factors. Um, different species do have different lifespans and live through different seasons of the year. And their diet and whether they migrate or not um, definitely does play a role in, in their longevity. So uh, just as one example, zebra longwings eat pollen as part of their diet and that contributes to a longer lifespan. Zebra longwings are state butterfly pictured up in the right corner, uh, commonly live for six months, whereas the Gulf fritillary butterflies live only about four to six weeks in warm weather and only about two to three weeks in cold weather. And pollinators come in many, many forms. Our, anima our animal pollinators, the bees, the moths, the bats, etc., they pollinate about 75% of the world's food and fiber and medicine crops, uh, according to the USDA. So chocolate, apples, pumpkins, and peaches are just a few of these. Um, so we're gonna go over the plate of the honeybee and some other lesser known pollinators and how we can help them as individuals. Um, and keep in mind that about 80% of all flowering plants, and as I said, over three quarters about of the staple um, crop plants that humans use rely on animal pollinators. So without these guys, we would really, really, really be in trouble. Bats and nocturnal moths are our nighttime pollinators. We have 13 native species of bat that live in Florida, and we have a total of 20 species that live in the state. We have some non-native fruit bat visitors that are more um, Caribbean bats, um, but they, they visit us and they, they, they live here full time for the most part. And they are actually our, our main bat pollinators. And just one insectivorous bat can eat more than 3,000 insects, including mosquitoes, in just one night. So bats are very valuable. 
Bats are, not all bats are nocturnal. Um, some are crepuscular, meaning that they're most active at dawn and dusk. So if you ever see a bat early in the morning, if you walk your dog early in the morning and you happen to see bats, those are probably the, the crepuscular species. Bats pollinate flowers that stay open at night and that are at least one inch in diameter. And they prefer light colored flowers and they generally have a fermented fruit or a musky smell. So things like bananas and mango, uh, guava, cacao, which chocolate is made from, kapok, giant saguaro cactus, um, fig, agave that tequila is made from, are all bat pollinated species. So bats pollinate over 300 species of fruit and over 500 species of other plants. Nocturnal moths, they pollinate things like yucca and gardenia, uh, tobacco, uh, morning glory, and most cacti among many others. And there's the, the really gorgeous luna moth pictured there. And despite popular belief, uh, not all moths are nocturnal. Um, some are diurnal, which means they're out during the day and they tend to be more brightly colored moths. Um, the ones that are out at night tend to be more subdued and more tan and brown colored. Um, there are also some that are crepuscular, like the bats that are only out during the twilight hours between, um, or uh, you know, before sunrise or after sunset. And there are about 160,000 species of moths. And out of the nocturnal ones, about 50,000 of them have developed these sort of modified ears on their bodies so that they can hear bats sonar noises at night because bats definitely like to eat moths at night. Here are a few of the diurnal Florida moths, the scarlet bodied wasp moth, the harnessed tiger moth, the polyphemus moth, the faithful beauty moth, which looks very much like a butterfly, the oleander moth and the white-tipped white black moth, which is also known as the snowbush spanworm. If you have snowbush plants, um, this guy has probably visited you to defoliate your, <laughs> your um, snowbush plants at some point. Um, some people don't realize that our that native that sorry, that honeybees are not native to the United States. So our common honeybee that makes our honey, the Apis mellifera, were actually brought here from Europe by our early settlers who were accustomed to having honey. And these are well-behaved bees. They're considered non-invasive and quite beneficial. They're really excellent, efficient pollinators of most food crops and absolutely none of our native bees are capable of producing honey. Bees prefer purple, white, yellow, and blue flowers. It's said that they can't even see the color red, so it is definitely a good thing that pollen is yellow, otherwise he would not even see that red flower that he's on. Here is a list of just a few of the examples of human food that is pollinated by bees. So you can see what kind of a situation we would be in if something terrible were to happen to the bees. We would then be forced to have people going out and pollinating all of these crops by hand. And believe me, that is not a situation that we ever want to be in. All right, the plate of the honeybee. Um, there are several disorders um, and, and in some cases, human cause situations that are impacting the honeybee negatively. Um, some of these are varroa mites, which are in relation to the bee, they're actually huge. Um, and it's really awful when these poor guys get varroa mites. There's the Israeli acute paralysis virus that can spread. Um, they have a gut parasite called nosema that can attack them. Uh, there's a par parasitic fly that can infect them. 
Um, and a lot of these things are brought on by the stress that bees are put under, um, both with um, pesticide usage and also the fact that bees in, in some cases are, are really relied on so heavily um, for human endeavor. They are, you know, boxes of, of hives are loaded onto flatbed trucks and they're trucked all around the country. They may go from Florida as a home base where they're doing some pollinating at, at one time of the year and then they're trucked all the way across the country um, to California to pollinate uh, almond crops there and sometimes during that process the the farmer sprays while the bees are there by accident um, so then the remaining bees are, are loaded up that survived that experience and then they're shipped off to Wisconsin to pollinate apple crops so um, we we really rely upon them and use them a, a lot um, for this extra pollination because in some of these areas, these crops don't have enough pollinators remaining to get that job done properly. So, um, so the, the transportation of the bees has become necessity, um, but it does really stress them out and, and it leaves them much more wide open to a lot of these various bee afflictions. Um, another mysterious phenomenon that may be linked to the use of systemic pesticides, which are also known as neonicotinoids or neonics sometimes. Um, they're the systemic pesticides that stay within the plant that I mentioned before. Um, it may be linked to that. There was a Harvard study done that, that did so, find some correlation between the use of systemic pesticides and colony collapse disorder, um, but it, it's, it's a, a very disturbing thing where the the beehive is is essentially abandoned and uh, even the honey is, is just left there so obviously there's been some sort of contamination happening with the honey because other bees will not come and take the honey um, and and all of the the worker bees and and the, the whole population of the hive just sort of disappears um, so it, it's mysterious and very alarming. Another thing that is alarming is that these neonicotine, neonicotinoid pesticides are being found in our honey that we consume. So an international study conducted by Swiss researchers in 2016, 2017, um, was set out to, to find out if, if possibly the honey that we're consuming might contain some of these pesticides. And they analyzed 198 honey samples from around the world. And it found at least one of the five tested for, um, it found at least one of the five tested compounds. Um, so acetamiprid, uh, clothiandin, imidacloprid, which is probably the most commonly used one, thi thiocloprid and thiomexotham um, in 75% of all the samples. 45% um, of the samples contain two or more of these compounds and 10% of the samples contain four or five of these compounds. So it is, it is getting into our, our food. It's getting into our honey supply. And you can learn more about non-native honeybees, which are very fascinating. Um, this is a really good UF site um, through our entomology department. And they're sometimes called Western honeybees, sometimes called European honeybees. Um, and they are also the bees that can sometimes hybridize with the Africanized bees. Florida has about 315 species of native bees. Um, it, that's a, a very large number and a lot of people are surprised by that, but um, we, we really do have a lot of native bees. Um, the Morrison's bumblebee, um, the impatient bumblebee, <laughs> uh, the blue orchard bee, and the southeastern blueberry bee, which is a ground bee. Those are a few of them. And these guys typically um, pollinate flowers with buzz 
pollination. Um, so they, they kind of rattle the pollen, um, which is also called sonication. The, the native bumblebees are the large, fuzzy, uh, charming, rather noisy bees. They travel really long distances, miles and miles for food gathering. They live in colonies, often in abandoned rodent dens and can be found under boards or empty flower pots even. And notice in this picture, uh, a good picture of the corbicula, which is the pollen basket where they, they gather that pollen and, and transport it that way. And the metallic sweat bee, they have these really beautiful iridescent colors. Um, you'll often see them mostly in green or blue in Florida, uh, mostly green here really. Um, and they are ground nesting bees and they have that name metallic sweat bee because they're attracted to the salt in human sweat. Um, the males pinch or bite and the females will sting if squeezed or squashed, um, but it's a mild sting. They are very important pollinators of flowering fruit and seed plants. And if you've ever had these near perfect circles cut in some of your leaves, um, certain plants they really prefer. Um, they really like eucalyptus. They really like rose bushes. Um, there are a few other plants that they, they tend to really favor, but they will make these little perfect circles. And then they form these kind of cigar-like nests that they um, will, they'll utilize um, one of these bee houses. Then they'll just kind of form that little cigar looking nest inside of, of a bee house. Um, so you can definitely provide one of these. Um, they make excellent habitat for the solitary bees. Um, minor bees, mason bees, and carpenter bees are all the solitary bees that would use such a structure. Um, they do not form colonies like the European honeybees. Um, out of the 4,000 bees native to America, we do have 29 in Florida that are endemic to Florida. That means that they live nowhere else but Florida. And solitary bees like to use structures that already exist, unlike the honey, the honeybees who obviously make their own uh, honeycombs. Um, you can make these very easily out of pieces of bamboo, and you can make really elaborate <laughs> bee condos such as this one um, that will really attract a, a great diversity of, of bees. And some people don't realize that beetles are also really great pollinators. And beetles were actually the major pollinator before the evolution of bees. So beetles were here first um, and bees appeared about 130 million years ago, whereas beetles appeared about 300 million years ago. So they were really kind of our, our first um, really efficient insect pollinators. Okay, here are some more pictures of the, the beautiful native bees um, and the, the beautiful uh, cuckoo wasp that's also very iridescent. And there's the orchid bee. If you have orchids in your yard, you, you'll see an orchid bee occasionally. They're quite beautiful as well. All right, so here is a picture of the surfid fly, which is... Um, both uh, kind of a predator insect, I'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, and also a very efficient pollinator in its own right. He looks kind of like a bee, but he's actually a true fly. Uh, all right, so the best thing to do is to choose a mix of plants that are going to be blooming at different times of the year so that you always have something for the pollinators to eat. So also a good variety of both the pollen providing plants as well as the nectar providing flowers so that you can increase your biological diversity, both of plants and insects. So the black eyed Susan provides pollen in spring and uh, even though it's non-native, it's still a great nectar plant. The purple fire spike, uh, it blooms in winter time. Here is a native ground cover for sunny areas, uh, sunshine mimosa. This is like candy to bees. You'll pretty much always have a bee on these flowers. 
uh, provides pollen for them. Um, it can be a little bit aggressive as it figures out where it wants to be in your yard, um, but it is not evergreen in the winter. If we have a cold winter, it will turn deciduous and kind of disappear, but it will come right back for you in the spring. And it really only happens if we have prolonged freezing temperatures. Otherwise you may have a warm winter and it stays year round. Coreopsis is actually our state wildflower. Um, there are a lot of different species of, of Coreopsis and our native pollinators love it. It self seeds very readily, uh, maybe too readily for some people. <laughs> uh, you, you may have to do a little bit of weeding with it. It may come up all over the place. Um, peak bloom is in late spring, but for most of the year you, you will get some flowers. Um, the different species have different requirements. So again, the right plant, right place. Some of them like wet conditions and some of them like dry. So you wanna research ahead to see which one is the most suitable for your conditions. Uh, blanket flower, Gylardia pulchella, is a beautiful native perennial, but it is a very short-lived perennial. It will reseed itself, however. Um, pollinators do love it and it blooms in the spring. Really amazing color. Zinnia is actually a non-native flower, but um, it's one of the few flowers that you might see in, in seed catalogs that you could actually order um, from another state and it would actually do pretty well here. Um, they, they do very well. Um, they're very low maintenance and they have great colors and great forms, um, really nice combinations and pretty low water usage. They're non-native as I said, but they're considered Florida friendly. The beach sunflower is a wonderful native ground cover plant um, with a really nice sprawling habit and it blooms for most of the year. Excellent pollinator plant. And we talked about this before, the oblong twin flower, Discursia oblongifolia. It makes about a 12 inch tall ground cover and it is the native larval food source like we talked about for the common buckeye butterfly among others. It is in the snapdragon family and it does this particular species as I mentioned does prefer the drier soils and it is evergreen and this is magnified um, greatly. The flowers are actually really tiny. A Spanish needle is that native that I talked about before that's kind of weedy, um, <laughs> uh, but it is native. And if you ever visit Fairchild Tropical Gardens down in Coral Gables, um, Miami area, they actually let it grow there to help the pollinators. So um, ever since I made that visit um, and I saw that they were doing it, um, being a little less, uh, uh, shall we say, fastidious in my yard with it. I'm letting it, I'm letting it grow a little bit more because <laughs> um, it really is an excellent pollinator plant and it is the larval host plant for the dainty sulfur and all bees absolutely love this plant. So it is really kind of a freebie plant that is weedy, but mm, it's excellent for pollinators. So you can make that call in your yard. <laughs> Purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea, um, is absolutely stunning. It's a gorgeous addition to any yard. Um, it blooms in the spring and the summer. Black-eyed Susan blooms in the summer or fall. There are different species of it. Um, shown here is Rudbeckia herta on the left and the cutleaf coneflower, um, Angustifolia, uh, variety Florentina on the right. Bee balm is a medium sized, short lived perennial native shrub that has gorgeous flowers. And of course, as the name indicates, bees absolutely love it. Um, it has summer flowers, and you can save the seeds to replant after the plant fades away. And it provides pollen. Basil is one of these unexpected plants that you might not necessarily think of as being a great bee plant, but it really is. The flowers provide both pollen and nectar, and you can collect the seed after it finishes blooming. 
once it goes crispy brown, collect them, dry them out, and you can replant your basil for the next crop. Um, and keep in mind that herbs can be used anywhere in your garden. Um, they don't necessarily have to be only grouped together in an herb garden. You can plant them all throughout your garden. And they smell really great and the pollinators really love them. Um, we actually do have a native basil as well that it's not really considered a, a culinary basil, but wild sweet basil is also an excellent addition to your garden. Just sometimes called starry rosin weed. Um, I did not write weed on here because this plant is not really weed-like. So I don't wanna turn anybody off with rosin weed. Um, I like to call it starry rosin because it, it is a well-behaved uh, wildflower. It is rather tall. It can get up to three feet or so, and it does go dormant in the winter, but it's gorgeous in the summer, June through September, it blooms. It can live in really dry collect and conditions and you can collect the seeds on it to replant them for the next season. And Liatris or Blazing Star, um, this is a full sun native bloomer. Um, blooming in the summer and fall. And again, any type of pollinator you can think of is, is going to be attracted to this plant. Blue sage is a short-lived perennial with white or blue flowers. It does have a rather lanky growth habit, so it's best when it's planted amongst other plants to kind of prop it up. Um, grasses particularly, it, it looks good with. Um, it will reseed and it is attractive to bees and butterflies. Tropical sage, I mentioned before, it blooms year round. They are excellent nectar providing plants for butterflies and hummingbirds. You can find it in red as well as the coral nymph, which is the more peachy color, peaky peachy. And there's also white. Um, your native local native plant nursery has all three colors. Here's the coral honeysuckle vine. Lenicera sempervirens. And this vine can grow in the sun or in partial shade. So um, you don't necessarily have to have a sunny spot for it. Of course, being a vine, you are going to want to provide something for it to grow up, either a trellis or an arbor. As I mentioned before, it is not an aggressive vine at all. It blooms for several months. It has these really pretty um, pendulous tubular flowers, quite quite beautiful, really beneficial. It also has red fruit that will attract um, native birds to your yard. The firebush, another great native shrub, medium to large size. Um, definitely we recommend the, the native one over the non-native one. So do definitely visit your local native plant nursery to get the native and it will attract native bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. It blooms generally spring through fall, and it is followed by fruit that is also attractive to birds. The false indigo is another native larval food source for a few different butterflies, including the southern dog face and the gray hair streak. It's a medium to large shrub that gets these really deep purple flowers. Um, bees really love it too, and it blooms in the hotter months. Red powder puff is a non-native, but it's considered Florida friendly. Um, it blooms for most of the year and is very, very attractive to bees particularly. Um, it can be trained as a small tree or it can be a large shrub. The woolly tea bush, Molochia tomentosa, it's a large native, um, medium to large native shrub. It does need full sun and it does not like irrigation. Once it's established, um, you can pretty much leave it on its own and it'll be much happier. Um, you'll find it to be constantly covered in pollinators that feed from these really pretty pale purplish pink flowers. And it blooms continuously for most of the year. Red fire spike. Um, and also there's a, a fuchsia um, species of it. 
um, which sometimes ends up being a little bit more lavender colored. Um, it's a great hummingbird plant. It's non-native, but it's considered quite Florida friendly. It attracts many pollinators. It prefers a, sh prefers a shadier environment rather than full direct sun. It grows to about eight feet tall. Um, it blooms in fall and winter when a lot of other plants are not blooming. So that's what makes it a valuable plant to add to your collection. Necklace pod is a native with really interesting, unusual foliage. And when it blooms, it has these yellow tubular flowers that are very uh, attractive to hummingbirds as well as butterflies. And it's one of these that's better if it's not pruned and left to its natural shape. And it pretty much attracts all pollinators and birds as well. Jatropha intergerima is a small tree that can be kept as a, as a medium shrub as well. Um, it has these scarlet year round flowers that attract hummingbirds and butterflies. It's very drought tolerant. Um, just be careful of your species selection. Um, Intergerima and multifida are fine, but there are other Jatropha's species that are invasive. King's mantle. This is a wonderful Florida friendly shrub and native bumblebees love this plant. It's funny, I love to watch them because they're too fat to actually fit inside the flowers. So they can nectar from the back of the flower and it's, it's very cute. <laughs> this guy gets to be a max of six feet tall and six feet wide. So it's great. It doesn't get out of control. It hardly needs any pruning at all. Once it gets up to its maximum height and is trained well, it pretty much stays that way. And it blooms for most of the year, including the winter. Um, it really likes to bloom in the winter. Um, very low maintenance, extremely Florida friendly. And it's been a really popular landscape plant um, actually since the 1920s. So it's proven itself not to be invasive. <laughs> That's always a good thing. This is our native Pineland Lantana, Lantana depressa, Floridana. And you want to try to avoid the non-native lantanas because they do tend to be invasive. So um, that's something that you're not gonna wanna buy from your big box store. You're gonna wanna get lantanas from your local native plant nurseries. Um, lantana, Pineland lantana grows to be about four feet tall and about six feet wide and it pretty much stops there. It blooms year round. It does not like to be irrigated, so um, pick a nice high and dry sunny spot for this plant and you'll be rewarded with the amount of life that is coming into your yard to visit this plant. It's one of those that is pretty much always covered with bees and butterflies. Um, it's amazing. Coral bean is another beautiful native. It has interesting shaped leaves that are nice even when it's not blooming. And then when it blooms, it's pretty spectacular with these big red tubular flowers that will, if you have any chance of having a hummingbird come to your yard, it'll probably come for this. Um, it's it's a, a great plant. It does have thorns though. So be careful of where you plant it. Sea grape is a beautiful native tree, um, medium sized, or it can be kept as a large shrub. It makes a really nice screen um, and it blooms late spring to summer. It, the blooms attract pollinators and the fruit in the fall is actually edible for humans and quite tasty. It's not just for coastlines. It can be used as a specimen in, in Florida landscapes all over. Um, just watch out if you're listening from, um, from an area that gets really cold. You, if you're beyond 9B, you're probably not going to want to use this plant. Um, but 9B, 10A, it's, it's ideal. And of course, our native um, sable palm, also called cabbage palm, sable palmetto, is our Florida state tree, even though it's not really a tree. Um, it's our iconic wildlife attracting plant. And bees absolutely love this plant when it blooms in the summer. You will just hear a, a buzz in the woods as you walk. You'll hear buzzing and it's coming from the tops of these sable palms that are in bloom. Um, just covered with bees. 
and it, it does provide food and cover for a, a myriad of, of native wildlife. So what we want to encourage is plant diversity. Um, we want to have as many diverse plant species as possible um, so that we can get a, a diversity of, of life into our yards and communities as well. Um, we want to discourage monoculture. So um, you want to avoid having, you know, just really long hedges of all the same non-native plant. That's really not going to bring um, any life into your yard. Um, principle number six of Florida Friendly Landscaping is reducing or eliminating pesticide usage. This is so important when it comes to trying to support pollinators. Um, you want to try to practice integrated pest management or IPM. And IPM means following um, the following methods to help control the, the pests in your yard. You want to identify the pests. Um, also look for beneficial insects who may already be there with that pest working to control the pest population. And if they are present, you may want to leave it alone um, and, and let that beneficial predator insect do its job. Um, generally speaking, they can keep it under control well enough to not really harm your plant. Um, if you have a really large infestation of a pest, think about pruning out that part of the plant and throwing it away, wrapping it up in a, tightly in a plastic bag so that you don't spread that pest. You don't wanna just throw that into an open container. You wanna wrap it up so the pest doesn't spread. Um, and think about using pesticides only as a last resort and trying always to use the least toxic item first and just spot spraying it only on the small affected part of that plant and not just blanket spraying your whole entire yard if you see a pest. And also, of course, keep in mind that a lot of the things that are in the past perceived as pests are a lot of these caterpillars that chew on these plants, but the caterpillars are not really the pest. The caterpillars are that butterfly trying to live. So that's another part of this is just kind of rethinking um, old, old ways of thinking about things. <laughs> Beneficial predator insects, such as the ladybug and the larva of the ladybug are, are really voracious predators of, of pest insects. We have the minute pirate bugs and the big-eyed bugs and the mealybug destroyers. If you look down at the right-hand corner, the, the larva of, of the cryptolamus beetle is, it looks kind of like a, a huge mealybug on steroids, um, but you can see the difference between the, the good bug, the larva of the beetle and the bad bug, the mealybug there. Um, so once you learn to identify that, you can see, oh, well, I may have mealybugs, but I also have the cryptolamus that is taking care of that problem for me. So you may not necessarily need to do anything as long as you see these predator bugs there as well. And here's the lacewing. If you've ever seen these really pretty delicate eggs hanging from the bottom of a leaf, that means you have lacewing eggs. And um, once those hatch, that becomes this larva that is also a really voracious um, predator that will go after aphids and scale and thrips. And it becomes a pollinator as an adult insect. And another beneficial is the hoverfly, also known as the surfid fly. And their larvae are also really excellent predators of aphids, particularly. And the adult fly is also an excellent pollinator. If you absolutely must spot spray something in your yard, always use the least toxic method, things like neem oil, horticultural oil, or insect killing soap. Um, but I just want to caution you that they, they will kill the beneficials as well. So, um, and I, I actually see on that label, they're showing mealybug, but they're showing the predator mealybug, the good guy. <laughs> Ooh. So it, it will wipe out, it will wipe out your beneficial insects as well and the things that you're trying to protect. So always use great caution if you, if you do use pesticides. 
And a lot of us have seen this very popular meme, save the bees. If we die, we're taking you with us. <laughs> it's such a cute little guy to have, <laughs> have such a, a, a scary threat. <laughs> but let's imagine our lives if we didn't have coffee, if we didn't have chocolate or almonds or blueberries among others. So, so let's really try our best to save the bees. And here are some parting thoughts. Again, you want to plant several different native larval host plants to attract butterflies to lay eggs on your plants. You want to plant pollen and nectar source plants, both that bloom at various times of the year. So that there's always food available for your adult pollinators. You want to plant a great diversity of plants in general. And as long as none of them are invasive, that's fine. They can be non-native as long as they are Florida friendly and non-invasive. Practice IPM, rethink your pesticide usage. Try to eliminate it entirely or limit it greatly to spot spraying and using the absolute least toxic substances and avoid those systemic pesticides, those systemic neonicotinoids. Learn to identify, scout out, and rely upon the beneficial predator insects to help manage your plant pests for you. And remember that your yard is an integral part of the protection and preservation of Florida's environment. And if you already have a Florida friendly yard, you can be recognized for it. You can make an appointment with me and we can come over to your home, socially distanced, wearing masks, <laughs> and uh, take a tour of your yard and give you one of these wonderful Florida-friendly landscaping signs um, to recognize your efforts. And I thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I'm gonna go through the questions right now and see what we have and I can answer those questions. Um, okay. Should oleander bushes be treated if it's infested with oleander caterpillars? Okay, well, that is up to you. Um, if you're willing to tolerate some damage, then I would say no, just leave it alone. Another part of this is the birds. Um, Birds, there are certain species of birds that need to feed their young 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars before the birds are able to fledge. So if we're wiping out all of these caterpillars, um, the birds have nothing to feed their young. So that's another part of, of the whole big picture is to, to think about the whole web here, the whole web of life. Um, so my feeling on that is no, let, let, um, let the birds come and take those caterpillars away to feed their young with them. Um, you know, because yes, some, some caterpillars can be considered pests. Some of them will defoliate a plant, but um, for the most part, hopefully the birds will find them and, and feed them to their young. Okay, the, the next question is, if a milkweed volunteers in our yard, can we assume that it is the native one and flowers are more yellow than red? Um, probably not. Um, it's probably going to be the tropical milkweed because um, it's so much more common, um, more people grow it and the, the seeds of it are, are so fine and they just kind of take to the air and proliferate really easily. So I have a feeling that probably if it's a, a volunteer milkweed, it's probably not the native one, especially since the flowers are more yellow than red. All right, any other questions? Uh, let me see. 
Okay. Um, question. Removing grass. Most people use Roundup. What is another natural route that I can take to remove grass? Um, okay, good question. One thing that we recommend is that you can smother your grass. So um, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a lot more packages in the mail these days. Um, so I kind of keep my cardboard and cardboard actually makes an excellent smothering material um, because it, it does break down eventually, um, but it does a really good job. You have to, you have to layer it really well. You have to kind of really feel your way through it because you have to leave enough space around plants and things like that so that you're not blocking plants that might be there from getting water to them. Um, but if you, if you layer your cardboard really, really well um, and, and overlap it and, and do a really good job of, of laying it tightly and then put a good three inches of, of a good mulch, um, I recommend floor mulch a brand for this, which is available at, at Lowe's and Big Earth uh, locally. Those are the only two places that carry it. Uh, well, I think Sweet Bay Nursery has it as well. Um, it, it really kind of compresses really well and it, it, they make a, a good partner, the cardboard and the floor mulch together um, to, to um, really get rid of that grass. It, it really works quite well. I did that in my whole entire backyard, um, other than one little patch of grass, and, and it worked beautifully. All right, any other questions? Let me see. Okay. Another question, how bad is the giant milkweed? Um, the giant milkweed has not proven itself to be really bad. I don't think um, that it, it's one of the favorites um, uh, among the, the milkweed feeding butterflies. Um, so I, I don't think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think that there's really been a whole lot of research done on it though. So um, for now, I would say probably it's not terrible, um, but if more research is done, that may change. Um, but for now, it's still considered Florida friendly for now. Okay, another question. What Florida plants do you recommend to use as a pollinator friendly hedge for privacy? Um, it depends on what area of the of the county that you live in or of the state if you're listening from out of the county um if you're in 10 10 a um in a warmer part of the of the county you could definitely use sea grape uh, as a really great pollinator friendly hedge um uh, let's see there are um a lot of different choices there um you can mix some species um you can use um some uh firebush as well firebush can get pretty large um the native firebush um that also can can make a, a part of an, an element of a, a mixed species hedge that's quite nice um, there are a, a lot of different um, options there. Um, there are even some non-native um, plants that you can think about, um, like the um, if if there's any shade involved at all there, you could um, use the the fire spike that gets to be about eight feet high. Um, let's see. If you don't already have it, I would definitely recommend that you get yourself um, the Florida Friendly um, Guide to Landscape Plants, um, which I would try to show you, but I know with my with my Zoom background, you won't be able to see it, it'll disappear. Um, but the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Guide to Plant Selection, you can get that from um, the local Swiftbud site. Um, 
the Southwest Florida Water Management District site it, website. You can order it very easily and have it shipped to your home for free. And that will give you a lot of different choices. Um, let me see. Okay, someone is asking to see the moth slides again. So let me let me go back in the background here and see. Um, let's see, it's not letting me. Let me come back to the moth slides in just one second. Um, let me get through the questions, um, Cheryl, and then I'll, I'll put the moth slides back on, okay? Um, okay, what is the name of the mulch? It's flora mulch. So flora, like Florida, the first part of Florida, flora, F-L-O-R-I, mulch. Flora mulch is the best type of mulch to use for the killing of grass with cardboard technique. <laughs> they net together really, really well. Um, you can actually dampen the cardboard too, which is something that I did if it's not gonna rain anyway when you're, when you're laying the cardboard, if you dampen it, it helps to kind of mold it down too. And it really works well. And then you can more easily lay the mulch on top of it and it works great. Um, someone is asking, where are the native gardens? Um, do you mean native plant nurseries or do you mean native gardens you can visit? Um, we do have native gardens here at Extension that you can visit that are native demonstration gardens. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking or not there, Cheryl, um, but our address is 1303 17th Street West. If you'd like to come here, you can visit our native gardens. Um, just come inside our building and, and one of our master gardeners or staff members can show them to you. If you were talking about um, local native plant nurseries, then we have Sweet Bay, which is located in Parrish. And um, in Sarasota, there's um, Florida native plants as well that's located in Mayaca in Sarasota County. Um, but our, our local one, if you're in this area, um, would be in Manta County, would be um, Sweet Bay Nursery. They're really great and they're out in Parish. As I said, they have a website you can, you can look up. All right, let me see if there's any other questions and then I'll go back to the moth. Oh, okay, yes. So Sweet Bay, if you're in Manta County, Sweet Bay is the name of the nursery and they have a great website. So check them out. Uh, okay, let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. I don't see any other questions. Okay, so I'm going to um, escape from here and go back and get to the moth slides for you. Where are we? Okay, getting closer. Okay, there's the first moth slide. I'm not sure if you wanted that one or if you wanted the diurnal moths, the moths that are out during the day. Um, I'll leave it here for a minute. Let me go back and see questions again. Um, okay. All right, so um, Cheryl, am I showing the right moth slides that you wanted to see, or do you want to see the other slide? Okay, I'm not hearing back, so I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if these are the ones you wanted to see or the other one. Um, 
All right, I think I have to escape again. Let's see. Okay. Oh, we have more possible questions here. Okay, let me see. Um, okay. Okay. Um, um, somebody asked about pinching flowers off of basil. Um, not if you're growing it for pollinators. <laughs> you want to leave the flowers on if you're growing it specifically to help the pollinators. Um, if you're growing it just for horticultural reasons, then um, yeah, then you you want to pinch them, but um, for pollinators, you want to leave them. Okay, let me see. If we have any other questions? Um, how to get re rid of weeds around flowering plants and other areas using non-toxic? Um, well, pulling them, <laughs> pulling them is the best thing to do, and then you you can definitely use the cardboard technique. Um, wetting the cardboard, like I mentioned, is, is a really good technique. Um, and then you can kind of mold it around plants so that you're not preventing the plant that you want to keep from getting water, but you're able to um, stifle the weeds that are around the plant. And then mulch, um, three inches of mulch is a, is a really good, is a really good um, thing to go by to help um, to help to control your weeds. Okay. Uh, does South Georgia count as a Florida friendly yard? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a South Georgia friendly yard. Um, all right. She has a candlestick tree. Um, that is. Um, Senna alata or Castia alata. Um, that one is a caution species here. Um, I don't know if it is in Georgia or not. It may be cold enough in Georgia that it's not a caution plant there, but here it's, it's a caution could be invasive um, or could become invasive. Um, let's see. Butterflies like it. It is. It's one of those that's a senna, a senna or cassia that can be um, considered a, a host plant, even though it's a non-native senna. Um, so butterflies will use it as a host plant. And like I say, I don't know if, if it is considered invasive in Georgia or not, but you're going to want to check with your local extension service in Georgia, and they can definitely tell you if, if it's caution in Georgia or not. Um, okay, I will put up another one. Pentas are not native, but readily available. Um, again, I'm concerned with purchasing pentas from a non-native nursery. Um, because they may be treated with pesticides, with systemic pesticides, and that's the last thing that you want uh, for a pollinator plant. So um, I do recommend pentas, but I can't recommend uh, where they're coming from. So um, I do know that the, the, the local native plant nursery in Sarasota, they do carry pentas there. Um, and I would call them and, and ask them and make sure that they're not treated with pesticides and um, Florida native plants is the one in Sarasota. Um, and I would recommend them as long as you know that they're not being treated with systemic pesticides. Um, is there a way of clearing the plant of pesticides? Um, not not while it's in your yard, <laughs> let's put it that way, really. Um, I mean, time, time does clear it. But during that time that you have it, uh, even if you're watching it, what you think is like 24 seven monitoring it so that nothing goes on it, things are going to be feeding from it. There's no way that you can watch the plant and make sure that nothing's feeding from it, even if it's on, you know, on a screened porch, probably things will get to it. So it does take time 
Um, and really it's just a matter of time before systemic pesticides are cleared out of the plant. Um, but you, you can't guarantee that nothing's gonna feed from it in the meantime. So um, in that sense, no, um, there's, there's really no way. I mean, you can try like drenching it, um, it, it may help to, I mean, like running, leaching it, not drenching it, leaching it with water, plain water, um, that could, could help, uh, to, to possibly get the pesticide out of it faster, but probably not. And it, the pesticide is just there. If it's a systemic pesticide, it's just going to be there. Okay. Cheryl, let me go back. I'm going to escape from here and go back and I'll show the other slide of the moths. Unfortunately, I can't, um, I can't operate the screen while I'm in the messages. So let me escape and go out. I'm going to stop share, go back. Okay, nope, that's not working. Okay. Um, let me try that again. Sorry, Cheryl, I'm trying to get the moths back up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me try. There we go. Okay, nocturnal moths. Okay, here's the other moth slide for Cheryl. And I'll just leave that up in the background. Um, let me see if we have any other questions or comments. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, another question is repeat the name or of the site where we can request the free guide. Um, well, this is the Florida Friendly Guide. So it's not just for native plants, it's for all Florida friendly plants. Um, so I'm gonna type that in here. And it is, um, the easiest way to find it is watermatters.org is the site for our Southwest Florida Water Management District or also called Swift Mud. Uh, whoops, it's the Swift Mud site. And once you get on watermatters.org, um, it, it has uh, resources, a button that says resources. So hit resources and then it'll walk you through. There'll be drop downs um, that you'll want to keep selecting, whatever you need to select. Um, it's a little bit convoluted <laughs> and it takes a little while to get there, um, but you're going to end up putting the Florida Friendly book in your cart and then you'll be selecting um, free postage or whatever it says. Um, so it will be sent to you for free. The book is free and the postage is free. Okay, so watermatters.org, our Swift Mud site for the Southwest Florida Water Management District is, is the organization that prints it and sends it for free. Okay. Uh, See, there's any other, okay. All right, thank you all very much for coming today. And I wish everyone who's still here <laughs> with us a very, very happy holiday season and a very happy new year. And please come and visit us again for more educational programming. Oh, not one more. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Happy holidays.
Remember, this is being recorded, so you will be able to find it on our YouTube channel. Oh, my email. Okay. My email is sjgriffith at ufl.edu. And feel free to email me any questions you have in the future. And you can send me pictures for plant ID and things like that. Anything horticulturally related, I am happy to help you with. All right. If no one has any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and end for today. But thank you again for joining and happy holidays and everybody be safe out there. Take care. <laughs>